Thank you, Re Representative Peters, and our thanks to President Obama for contributing to today's celebration. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patricia Moradian. I have the distinct honor of being president of the Henry Ford, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this wonderful day, this commemorative event, the 100th anniversary birthday celebration of an icon of the American Civil Rights Movement, Rosa Parks. We are celebrating both the anniversary of Mrs. Parks' birth and perhaps even more importantly, the lasting and living legacy of this social innovator. We've called this day's celebration a National Day of Courage, whereby we ask all Americans to follow Rosa Parks' example and commit to taking a stand and making a real difference in the world. We are grateful that the United States Senate has formally and officially endorsed that special designation for this commemorative event. As your printed programs reveal, we have a truly rich, exceptional, and full array of events scheduled throughout the day with nationally renowned speakers from the public, private, and academic sectors. We have musical performances, as you just heard, and special commemorative activities. I'd like to offer our particular thanks to Senators Carl Levin and Debbie Stabenow, Congressman John Conyers, Jr., Gary Peters, and John Dingell, who's represented here today by his wife, Debbie Dingell, for their leadership and assistance in securing Washington's recognition of Rosa Parks' centenary and our National Day of Courage celebration and to Michigan Representative George DeRaney for introducing a similar resolution that was adopted by the Michigan House of Representatives declaring today, February 4th, 2013, as the Rosa Parks National Day of Courage in the state of Michigan. I also want to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors. Without them, today would not be possible. So thank you to Target Corporation, Xfinity, and USA Network Characters Unite for helping make today's events possible. And lastly, I want to thank the members of our Board of Trustees, and particularly our Board Chairman, Evan Weiner, our trustee and former President of the Henry Ford, Steve Hamp, trustee and Vice Chairman, Sheila Ford Hamp, and trustee Al Uzielli for all of their support and assistance in helping to shape today's special commemoration. Thank you. And now, I'd like to make a suggestion to all of you who are here today. At some point today, please make sure that you find time to sit on the Rosa Parks bus, which is located to my left, to your right, in the With Liberty and Justice for All exhibition. It truly is a compelling and transformative experience, and one that will carry a special meaning today. It has since we opened that exhibit just six, seven years ago, been one of my favorite experiences in the museum. And lastly, I want you to know that our program today is being videotaped by Detroit Public Television for both live streaming on the internet, available locally, nationally, and internationally, as well as for later public broadcast. We hope that you'll find today's special program enlightening inspiring and entertaining. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the mic a dear friend of our organization and a valued member of the Henry Ford's Board of Trustees, Mr. Al Uzielli, who will introduce our keynote speaker for our National Day of Courage celebration of Rosa Parks. Al, thank you for helping us in all that you do. Good morning, everybody. It's really an honor to be here today. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here to celebrate Rosa Parks' 100th birthday on this National Day of Courage. The Henry Ford has always been a very special place for me and my family because it connects history to our lives, whether it be in school or with the issues we face today, and it helps to put into perspective the needs we'll face for the future. The Henry Ford is the place for important events such as this one, where people from around the world can gather and honor a social innovator who simply changed the world. 
Today we have the privilege to hear from world-renowned historians, scholars, and authors as they discuss the courageous act of a soft-spoken but strong-willed seamstress as we gather just steps away from the actual bus on which history was made. I'm delighted to introduce this morning's featured speaker, my friend Julian Bond. Julian has been an activist for civil rights, economic justice, and peace since his days at Morehouse College in Atlanta, where he became the coordinator and the spokesman for civil rights demonstrations. For all of the students in today's audience, I want you to know that in 1960, while he was a student, Julian made a courageous commitment and started the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, a student-led civil rights organization that directed three years of nonviolent anti-segregation protests that won the racial integration of Atlanta's movie theaters, parks, and lunch counters. Julian was also one of the many students from across the South who helped to form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. He later became SNCC's communications director, responsible for printing its, its weekly magazine, The Student Voice. He also worked in voter registration drives throughout the rural South. Julian was elected to four terms in the Georgia House of Representatives and later to six terms in the Georgia Senate. He was president of the Atlanta branch of the NAACP for 11 years and in 1998 was elected chairman of the NAACP National Board and served for 11 terms until becoming chairman emeritus in 2010. Julian is currently a scholar in residence at the American University in Washington, D.C. For 20 years, he was also a professor at the University of Virginia. He also held pro uh, visiting professor and research fellowships at Harvard, Drexel, Williams, and the University of Pennsylvania. Time Magazine has named Julian Bond one of its top 200 leaders, and he also hosted Saturday Night Live, which I think is really cool. <laughs> I met Julian in 2010 when I boarded a bus with him and his wife Pam and 30 other individuals in Memphis, Tennessee. From room 306 at the Lorraine Motel, he took us on a life-changing journey through the South. Places like Birmingham, Selma, Albany, Money, and Montgomery. Names like King, Till, Evers, Meredith, Foreman, Abernathy, and Rosa Parks all became tangible and truly understood. I thought I knew a lot about the civil rights movement, but until I walked in the footsteps of the movement with Julian Bond, I realized I knew very little. I'll be returning to the South with Julian next month, and I'm very excited about that. So I'm so pleased that today, in the museum founded by my great-great-grandfather, an institution that he cherished as much as the company that bears his name, we are all here to pay tribute to one of America's most courageous heroes, Rosa Parks. And I couldn't be more proud and excited to welcome my good friend, Julian Bond. Thank you a great deal, Al. That was very kind of you. Much appreciated. And I appreciate your mentioning that I once hosted Saturday Night Live. The audience may not know, it used to be a comedy show. <laughs> it's a great, great pleasure to be here on this occasion today. It's just a wonderful honoring of a wonderful person. And to be a part of it is, means a great, great deal to me. It was from Court Square in Montgomery that the order was sent to reduce Fort Sumter, beginning the Civil War. It was from that same court square that 94 years later, on a December evening, Ms. Rosa Parks began her historic bus ride. I recently read an entry from a Civil War diarist, Lucy Rebecca Buck, a supporter of the Confederacy. She was 20 years old and living with her family in Virginia when she wrote, we shall never any of us be the same as we have been. The day Ms. Parks stood up for justice by sitting down, a modern diarist could have written, we shall never any of us be the same as we have been. Four days after Ms. Parks' arrest, the Montgomery bus boycott began. That evening, at the first mass meeting, Dr. Martin Luther King declared, when the history books are written in the future, somebody will have to say, there lived a race of people, a black people, who had the moral courage to stand up for their rights, and thereby they injected a new meaning into the veins of history and civilization. The boycott also introduced King, the 26-year-old pastor of a Montgomery church, to the nation and the world. 
A historian wrote, although Martin Luther King played a crucial role in transforming a local boycott into a social justice movement, he was himself transformed by a movement he did not initiate. In Montgomery, the boycott owed its success to what another historian calls the self-reliant NAACP stalwarts who acted on their own before King could lead. Rosa Parks was first among those NAACP stalwarts. Claiborne Carson, the director of the King Institute at Stanford University, recently told an audience of which I was a member, Rosa Parks made Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King did not make Rosa Parks. She became such an icon in American history and popular culture that the Neville brothers immortalized her. They sang, thank you, Ms. Rosa, you were the spark that founded our freedom movement. Thank you, Sister Rosa Parks. Now, she wasn't the first to refuse to surrender to Montgomery's apartheid. There had been Claudette Colvin. There had been Mary Louise Smith and others before her, those who believed they had rights like any other citizen. But she was the first person to plead not guilty. For her, breaking Alabama law was obeying the Constitution. It was defending justice. She was tired, all right, tired of mistreatment. She was tired of second-class citizenship. But she never grew tired of fighting, either in the years before the boycott or the many years after. Nine years after she died, she spoke at the funeral for Robert Williams, the renegade NAACP president from Monroe, North Carolina. Williams had answered Klan attacks bullet for bullet. For his courage, the NAACP expelled him. The state of North Carolina made him a criminal. He found safety in Cuba and China. He became an all but forgotten man. In 1996, 83-year-old Rosa Parks, the exemplar of nonviolence, stood in a church pulpit in Monroe and eulogized Robert Williams. I was many who eulogized Ms. Parks when she died in 1995. It was my great pleasure to have known her over the years, giving me precious memories of the times we were together. Once, when I was speaking here in Detroit, my host asked me if I'd like to go out for a drink with Rosa Parks. Of course, I said yes. Ms. Parks had a Coca-Cola. She turned to me and she said, Julian, what are you doing now? Where are you living? I said, Ms. Parks, I've moved to Washington, D.C. I just saw you on TV there. You and Jesse Jackson were picketing the Greyhound bus station in D.C in support of the striking bus drivers. And I said, Ms. Parks, you know, I've just taken a job at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. It's too close and too expensive to fly there. The train isn't convenient. The best way to get there from DC is by bus. And in her sweet, calm, quiet, respective, gentle manner, she said, don't you get on that bus. <laughs> well, her manner concealed her mettle. In her new biography, The Rebellious Life of Ms. Rosa Parks, Jean Theo Harris shows us a longtime activist committed to fighting white supremacy from her earliest days. From dangerous underground investigations of white on black rapes in rural Alabama, where no law respected or protected black people, to her work alongside Robert Williams, Rosa Parks not only sat down on the bus, she stood on the right side of justice for her entire life. She heads the list when the role of sacrifice is called. She gave an equal measure of devotion so that all of us might be free. So let us all say thank you, Sister Rosa, thank you, Rosa Parks, and let us all dedicate ourselves to freedom's fight. There are those gathered here today who cannot remember the period when these sacrifices made by Mrs. Parks and others began, with the small cruelties and death-dealing inequities. There are too many young, there are many people too young to remember that from seeming hopelessness, there arose a mighty movement, simple in its tactics, overwhelming in its instinct, impact. That movement had its beginnings in Montgomery when a people, following Ms. Parks' example, chose to walk in dignity rather than sit in segregated despair. From there, the movement and its method th spread throughout the land. In 1955, when the bus boycott began, the American South was an apartheid society, a world where racial differences were legitimized by law. A white Southern woman described it this way. She wrote, I remember from my early childhood that white robed men did sometimes ride out, that there were lynchings from time to time. In those days, black people could not vote. They could not travel because no lodging place would admit them. They're restricted to only the most menial jobs. There were a few restrooms marked colored, which were the only ones they could use. No matter how hot the day, they could not drink at a public fountain unless it was one of the few marked colored. They were not allowed to try on clothes in the stores. 
in cities where buses were everybody's means of transportation, they had to sit in the back of the bus. And I often saw them as they made their way down the crowded aisles to the back, sworn at as if they accidentally brushed against a white person. When they went to the movies, they had to use a separate entrance and sit in the balcony. No black could ever come to a white person's front door. And the wonder of it, she writes, is that the good-hearted among us, and we Southern whites are basically a good-hearted people, did not even see the harsh injustice and indignity in all of this. It was simply the way things were. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled against segregation's legality. Soon a movement arose to challenge its morality as well. There had been other protests against this evil system, in the courts and in the streets, but after Montgomery, the protests swelled to a collective force. College students adopted the techniques of Montgomery and began accepting jail without bail as they sat down to stand up for civil rights. They soon attacked interstate travel with their bodies and segregated ballot boxes across the South as well. Through all this period, the federal government helped only when it had to, when white lives and property were under attack. State and local governments worked in active concert with white terrorists, and the movement's people had few allies beyond themselves. From its inception, it was a people's movement. The cumulative effect of individual acts of courage and passive resistance brought about our modern democracy's finest hour. By 1965, Jim Crow was legally dead. Most of those who made the movement were not famous. They were the faceless. They weren't the noted. They were the nameless. They were the marchers with tired feet, the protesters beaten back by fire hoses and billy clubs, the unknown women and men who risk job and home and life. We honor all of them today. They teach us what courage is. We honor Robert and Jeannie Gratz. On the Sunday after Rosa Parks' arrest, King called on his contribution to join the planned one-day boycott. Other black ministers across the city did the same, as did one white minister, Robert Gratz, who pastored a black Lutheran congregation. As Theo Harris writes, he and his wife had been viewed as racial oddities since moving to Montgomery from Ohio. They sat in the black section of the movies. Local whites shunned them in stores. Weeks after the 382-day boycott came to a successful end, the Gratz home was virtually destroyed by a bomb while their family, including their four-day-old baby, slept. The Gratzes teach us what courage is. We honor the Reverend James Reeb, who also answered the call for Martin Luther King, Jr this time to come to Selma in 1965. After watching the brutal beating of protesters attempting to march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Dr. Reverend Reeve, the father of four young children, left his home in Boston and flew to Alabama. The next day, walking back to the marcher's headquarters with two other ministers, Reverend Reeve was clubbed to unconsciousness by white racist thugs. He died two days later. Among the outpouring of messages sent to his widow was a Purple Heart medal with this note. Your late husband, Reverend Reeve, volunteered to accompany his fellow men against a force of greater threat to the principles of our country than my opponent, the German soldier. Reverend Reeve was unarmed except for his convictions. Reverend Reeve teaches us what courage is. We honor Viola Luizzo of Detroit, who also lost her life attempting to gain rights for others. A mother of five, she traveled too, saw the horrible images from Bloody Sunday, and traveled to Selma, saying that the struggle was everybody's fight. After the successful attempt to march on March 25, 1965, Ms. Luizzo helped to ferry local marches from Montgomery back to their homes in Selma. Four Klansmen pulled their car besides hers, killing her instantly with two shots to the head. Viola Luizzo teaches us what courage is. We honor Dorothy Counts. She was 15 years old when in September of 1957, she enrolled in an all-white high school in Charlotte, North Carolina. As Dorothy walked to school, the wife of the leader of the White Citizen Council urged the boys to keep her out and the girls to spit on her. She kept on walking. Many people threw rocks at her. Many did spit on her. So many that her mother said when Dorothy got home, her dress was so wet with sweat, with pit, spit, she could wring it out. Dorothy Couch treats us, teaches us what courage is. We honor Hartman Turnbow, a black farmer in Mississippi, the most brutal state of the old Confederacy. I remember him, dressed like the farmer he was in coveralls, boots, and an old hat. Mr. Turnbow carried a briefcase. When he opened that briefcase, there was nothing in it but a 45 automatic. And in April 1963, Mr. Turnbow went with a group of other black farmers in Holmes County, Mississippi, to try to register to vote. When the sheriff asked, who will be the first, no one moved. Then Mr. Turnbow said, me, Hartman Turnbow. 
I came here to die to vote. I'll be the first. Four days later, the Klan firebombed his home and fired multiple shots into his living room. Mr. Turnbow fired back. Then the sheriff charged him with arson, accusing him of setting fire to his own uninsured home. Hartman Turnbow teaches us what courage is. We honor Fannie Lou Hamer. If Mississippi was the most repressive state, Ms. Hamer was the most heroic freedom fighter. When the movement came to her town of Ruleville in 1962, she was 44 years old, a timekeeper on a plantation. One definition of courage is acting in the face of fear. Ms. Hamer's biographer, after noting that people challenged the fear in big ways and small rights, if Fannie Lou Hamer felt that fear, she suppressed it or overpowered it, eventually with rage. She had much to fear herself, everything from physicians who harmed her and neglected her to plantation owners who threw her off their land, from night riders who fired shots over her pillow to politicians who sought to silence her. Ultimately, all those people came to fear her because she would not be silenced, in part because they had no way to control her. She owed them nothing, and she gave them hell, despite the fear. Fannie Lou Hamer teaches us what courage is. The movement succeeded in spite of cowards planting bombs in the night, in spite of bombs shots fired in darkness, in spite of lynch mobs and hooded thugs, in spite, as Dr. King said, of the brutality of a dying order shrieking across the land. And in its successes, it has much to teach us today. As the old freedom song reminds us, ain't but one thing we did wrong, we stayed in segregation a day too long. Ain't but one thing we did right, and that's the day we started to fight. Yesterday's movement succeeded, in part, because the victims became their own best champions. When Mrs. Parks refused to stand up, and when Dr. King stood up to preach, mass participation came to the movement for civil rights. Now it falls to us to continue that fight. Five decades ago, we marched, we picketed, we protested, and we brought state-sanctioned segregation crashing to its knees. We must continue to fight. Yesterday's headlines sent forth the message that we move forward fastest when we move forward together. Today, we have more experience, more legal skills, more allies than we had then. We have more than a century's worth of aggressive <coughs> self-help and volunteerism in church and civic club, assisting the needy, financing the cause of social justice, an equally long and honorable tradition of struggle and resistance. We can double our support for, support for those organizations which guard our liberties and protect our rights. We can realize our full political potential, rewarding those who support equal rights and punishing those who don't. We can monitor our children's schools, making sure the end of education isn't the beginning of a lifetime of unemployment or a pathway to jail. We must continue to fight. Next to those we honor today, we're called upon to give comparatively little, our time, our energy, our caring. As Robert Kennedy once said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and then the total of these acts will be written the history of each generation. It is from numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. May we cre create great ripples of hope. Thank you all very much.